I, it's time for us to start the lecture today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this lecture. Is the sound OK? Is too loud or? Yeah. So today, this lecture is about DC machine drive, how we can design the drive for the DC machine. Uh, before starting this lecture, I will also repeat a little bit from the previous le lecture. It's mainly uh, the filter design part, the last part of the, of the previous lecture, previous week's lecture. So what we see in the previous week, that every converter have some ripple voltage and ripple current. Like it's a thyristor converter here. And if you look at the thyristor converter and what you see that, it has some ripple voltage. And if you derive the expression for the ripple voltage, then it will be like this here. So this is the ripple voltage. And we got the expression for the ripple voltage. And we see that the ripple voltage mostly appear across the inductor. So if we do the integration of the voltage and also divided by the inductor, then you will see that we have some ripple current. And this is the ripple current here. Expression for the ripple current for thyristor converter. And it has a long derivation to obtaining to this equation, but we are not going through this equation. And you will also not be asked in the exam to derive this expression. It's OK to understand that if we derive the expression for the ripple voltage, and we will get some here, here. And then we need to use this equation for designing the filter in the control part. So this is for the thyristor. And also, we see that odd scale scenario for the thyristor when the firing angle 90 degree, which corresponds to this green curve, something like this. So we got a very large ripple when you have the firing angle 90 degree. So this is for the thyristor based converter. And if we look at the other converter like buck converter, and if we derive the expression for the buck converter, the ripple current, and you'll find this expression for the ripple current. So we will need to use this expression when you design the filter component. And if you see the full bridge, then we see the expression something like this for the full bridge converter. And if you draw it and we see that, we, we can have the two uh, different curves, like here. You will see one ripple curve, something like this, and the another one is like this. So this also depends on the modulation pattern, how we are applying the PWM signal. If it's uh, bipolar PWM, then you'll get something like this. If it's monopolar, then you'll get like this. I think when you study the power trains course, then you have little understanding about the monopolar and the bipolar PWM generation. Like in the monopolar, we provide only one switching signal. Like if it's a full bridge converter, like this, and we have four switches, and If we have the carrier signal, like uh, this triangular signal, if it's monopolar switching, then we provide only one switching signal, one modulation index. Then we compare. If it's bipolar, then in the set of one, we provide two modulation signal. One is plus, and one is minus. So based on this, Based on this modulation index, and you will see that you will have a, a different ripple. Like it's almost 50% reduction when you use the bipolar switching for this full bridge converter. So now we have the ripple, and we need the expression for the ripple, and we need this information, this ripple information, when we design the filter. So if you look at the control, and we see that we have the PI controller. 
which I can write Kp, Ki over S. And we have the reference current, which is I ref. And we have the feedback current. And it passing through a filter, a low pass filter, which is one plus Tf S. And then we have the process here, process transfer function. That give us the current and we are sending the current through the low pass filter here. So if we look at the control signal, at this point we get the control signal, U control. Now we are interested about the ripple because this give us some ripple and we don't want to pass the ripple through the controller. Why you do not want to pass the ripple through the controller? Because the controller can amplify the ripple and then it can switch between uh, 0 to 1 or minus 1 to plus 1. So to avoid the, this disruption in the modulation index, we try to avoid the ripple. And we can have maximum 8% ripple, not more than that. It's because if you look at the, if you look at the output, you control signal, and which you see that, we have the controller and the reference. Uh, current reference minus filtered portion of, of the measured signal. So what you see, the ripple component, they are always in high frequency. This high frequency means, here what we have, we have S, we can write S equals to J of omega. If omega is very high, ripple is high frequency, and omega is very high for the ripple, this means this part is very small, integral part. So we also put a sign here for ripple voltage, the ripple current. And this frequency, ripple frequency is very high, so we can neglect this part. And only we have the U control signal here, which is Kp, is coming as a function of like uh, Tf, the filter signal, and the I, ripple current here. Yeah, you can put the minus, but it's not that important. So this is what we see the ripple component uh, passing through the controller. And we try to limit this ripple component not more than 8%. So we always try to have them less than equal 8%. And if you look at the KP, and we apply the modulus optimum tuning criteria to find this KP. For example, for a thigh register controller, and we get the Kp, which give us uh, which give us Kp like this. Here, T sum, which is a T delay because of the because of the PWM or other things, and we have the Tf for the filter. So we got this is Kp. And we see that Kp is a function of also uh, filter time constant. And we want the whole ripple less than 8%. So what we know, we know the ripple frequency for a particular converter. If a high register converter, and we know that this could be the maximum ripple. And we know the time delay from the process. And we have also Ks from the process. The unknown value is Tf. And then we can have the less than 8%. Then we put the control signal, uh, ripple of the control signal equals to 8%, then we can solve it for Tf. And if you plot it, uh, this E control, as a function of Tf, and if we set all of the value there, then you will find something like this curve here. And we have the U control signal, and this Tf, this is the filter time constant. So we say that we cannot have more than 8% ripple. So this is 
10 to the power minus 1, this means it's a 10% ripple. And if you want to have 8% max ripple, then 9, 8, somewhere here. So we can set that. We can have the maximum ripples, like something like this. Then you will get the time constant for the filter. So this gives us the time constant for the filter. So we can get the time constant of the filter. So that's how we can solve it for a thyristor converter. We can also do it for other converter. So we have a big expression here, U control. Uh, if you look at the compendium, you will find detailed expression how we came to this, uh, this formula. Like full bridge or maybe back bus, other converter, when you have this PWM signal, then you will see that the control signal, the ripple of the control signal, come as a function of the uh, uh, ratio between filter time constant and the switching frequency, switching time constant. So you have the control signal, and you have the ratio between the TFT, the filter time constant, and the carrier signal, triangular signal. So we plot it here. Then we say that we cannot have more than 8%. So here we have the 10%. This is the 10% point. Yeah, this is the 10%. Maybe we can have maximum 8, 5, or somewhere. Like somewhere this percent. That gives us the TFD over the switching frequency. So we got, we got this one. Uh, filter time constant divided by the uh, carrier, system, uh, carrier time constant. Uh, period of the carrier. And then we got the value here. Then we set this value here, and we know the carrier frequency, the triangular frequency of the converter that you are setting here. And one, we set the period of this. Then we got this value from the curve that give us the filter time constant. So we don't need to derive all the whole formula, but main purpose for you to know how to apply this formula when we design the when we design the control for the drive. Any question here up to? So this chapter here in chapter three, we just discuss. Uh, the basic way, general way, how to design the control and how to design the filter. But next chapter, from the DC drive, induction machine drive, all this drive, we will use this formula to design the real drive. And you also do it in the lab, that you need to design uh, your own control system for the, for the drive system that you will work in the project. So once we know all the basic theory, how to design the control and the parameters of the filter and all other things, then we are now ready to design a real drive system. So we'll start with the DC machine drive. And in this lecture or in this week, what we will do, we'll try to drive the dynamic model of a DC machine. And what we see when we want to design a control system, then we need the transfer function. Once we have the process transfer function, then we can use the uh, controller. And we can then apply which method we should apply. Is the uh, modulus optimum tuning or the symmetrical optimum tuning based on the process transfer function? So the first uh, thing we need to do is to derive the dynamic model of the system. Once we derive the dynamic model, then we can design the control system. Uh, in this course, or in this lecture, we'll also discuss about the power unit model. And I'll talk about why we'll, uh, we'll work on the power unit model of the system. 
And if you remember from power system course, what is the power unit model? Like if we have the actual voltage, which is V, V, or V, and then we divide the base voltage. And here, this V has the SI unit, like voltage, unit as a voltage. And we have the VB, base voltage, which also has a unit voltage, that give us the B per unit. And the B per unit is the unit less. So we'll discuss more detail also uh, when we develop the model in per unit. And then we'll discuss about the controller and how we can calculate the controller gain. Then also a little bit how we can simulate in the MATLAB Simulink. So in order to develop the dynamic model of a machine, we need to understand how a machine work and, and what it does in internally. In machine course, I believe you, had, you all had a machine course and you have the very basic, the basic understanding of a machine. So here we have short repetition. Uh, this is the machine. It mounted on a, some base on the ground. This is a DC machine. And in this machine, what we have, if we look at the winding, we have mainly four types of winding. The first one is called the field winding. Do you look at, do you find it where the field winding? For the DC machine, field winding is here. So we have this field winding in the DC machine. These are, they generate positive and negative, uh, south and north and south pole. In the DC machine, it's also possible to put a permanent magnet. They also produce the south and north pole. So you have this field that produces the south and north pole and also the field flux here. And then you have the compensation winding and here, these are compensation winding. This compensation winding is mainly used to uh, avoid the saturation in the system. Also, it has some other function. So these are the compensation winding. And then we have the armature winding. So this is rotor here, and we have this winding and they are the armature winding. And the last one we have, the commutation pole winding, and those are the commutation pole winding. So we provide power, DC voltage, with the field, field winding, And that produces the positive and negative voltage. Uh, that gives the uh, north pole and the south pole in the machine. And also we supply power uh, to the armature. So we have the armature. You can see these are the two carbon brush. And when the uh, machine rotate, yeah, we have, we can say we have the supply power here armature power, that uh, we provide armature power here, and then when it rotate, then this armature winding, they are rotating. So they always change the position. So in this course, we need to mainly focus on this field winding and the armature winding, the commutation pole winding and the compensation winding, they are not that much important for designing the control part, so we'll not discuss that much about compensation winding and the field winding. And one thing here, you notice that uh, the power, uh, the DC power that we are supplying, and if you see that, the field is producing magnetic flux that is going in, in this way, right? They are the field one. So you can see they are going these two, that direction. This means producing north here and south here. And for the armature, we are providing power, the DC, power supply here. So if you look at the right-hand rule, 
and you will see that they produce flux, which will be something like this direction. So they are the flux produced by the armature, and those are produced by the field. And one uh, thing you notice from here, the flux produced by the armature, they are not going up to the field, but the flux produced by the field, they are passing through the armature. This means this flux, they will produce some in this voltage here in the armature, but the flux produced by the armature is not cutting the field, so there will be no in this voltage in the field because of the armature flux. So this is just a basic construction of a DC machine. And we have here only two pole. So this means one pole fares. But you will see that some other machine, some other, they might have more than one pole fare, maybe two pole fare here. So this is just a basic construction of a, of a DC machine, and also since we have separate power supply, both the armature and the field, so we call it separate magnetized DC motor since we are providing separate power supply, one power supply for the field and one power supply for the armature. So we call it separate magnetized DC motor. For a small machine, uh, the rotor, they are laminated iron sheet. I think you know what is laminated iron sheet. This is a small, thin iron plate that we put all together to construct the a rotor. We can also have the laminated iron sheet for the stationary part. This laminated iron sheet is mainly to reduce the iron losses and also the hysteresis losses. For a small motor, we don't care about that much, the losses here. We only keep the laminated iron sheet for here. Yeah, that's what I was saying, that the small flux link is from the armature current and the large flux link is from the field current because you will see that there's a large flux link is from the field current, but it's only be a small flux here for the armature. So when we design the control, we mainly considered the uh, armature winding, they are the main part, and also the field winding when we design uh, the control system for this machine. And the rest of the part, we are assuming part of the, uh, we model part of the armature or the field. So this field and the armature, they are the most important when you design the control. And also we do some simplification, some assumption. And these are the three assumptions that we consider. We neglect the magnetic saturation. You know that one is a magnet, uh, mag it has a magnetic property, then it has some behavior because of this magnetic property. But we neglect the magnetic saturation when you design the control. And also we assume that resistor is independent of the temperature. Because when the machine operates, then temperature goes high, so it can have the some uh, property, some behavior, but we neglect uh, the time, uh, in the, uh, temperature dependent behavior of the resistor. And also the mechanical part, mechanical damping losses are modeled as a part of the load. When we model the load and then we assume that this damping and the losses is a part of the load. Now the question is that if you look at the induction machine, then we only supply the power to the stator, only one of the part of the machine. We don't supply power both the rotor and the stator together. But what will happen if we supply power only to the uh, either 
uh, your field or the stator? Will it uh, rotate? Will it rotate the machine? So you can look at it from here. For example, if you supply uh, the power only with the field, if you supply the power to the field winding, then what will happen? It will create a north pole here, south pole here, and because of this flux, and you will see there in the armature winding, you will find the south pole and the north pole. And these two in the armature is producing because of the uh, field flux. So what do you see that? Uh, this is north pole and this is south and they stick together. So there is no force here around that forcing to rotate the machine. So if you supply power only in the stator, the machine will not rotate. <laughs> Similarly, if you only supply power in the stator, in the armature, like you just supply power in the armature here. What will happen if you supply power only in the armature, then you will see that based on the supply power, based on the flux, it will create somewhere north and somewhere south pole of the magnet, and they also induce some south and north here, and they will stick together because it's a north and south pole. And whether it will be north or south, it depending on the uh, polarity of the voltage. So if you supply uh, only the armature, and they will see that north and south and north and south, so they stick together, they will not rotate. So that's what we see in the DC machine, that if you supply only one of the winding, then they will not rotate. But what will happen if you, if you supply power in both, uh, uh, if you supply power, both the uh, armature winding and the field winding, what will happen? Now say that you supply power, both armature winding and the field winding, and you will see that here, when you supply the armature winding, then it create north pole, and the south pole here. And you also supply power to the field, and they will produce north pole and the south pole here. So now what do you see here? It has a north pole, and north pole here, and south pole, and south pole here. So. This is the south pole, and it will attract the north pole. And you have the north pole here, it will attract this south pole. So it, it feels a force here. This means this north pole will be attracted by the south pole, and this is the fixed position, so this rotor will try to rotate anti-clockwise. So when we provide in supply, both the field winding and the armature winding, and we see that because of this here, the pole created by this flux, and also here we have the uh, pole because of this flux in the armature, and it will start to rotate. <coughs> and we supply the power here, it's a perpendicular, 90 degree, with the, with the field, and that will produce the maximum, uh, maximum torque. So therefore we have the brushes here, they are perpendicular with the, with the field, and now they will rotate. So this is just some basic about the, about the machine. And one thing here, what we see that, when you have the north and here south, and the, we provide the armature current, which is a positive current, and the entering current here, entering current here, leaving current here, because this is the dot and the cross, and that produces the north pole here and the south pole. So we see that it's rotating anti-clockwise. But what will happen if we, if the current, we change the direction of the current, opposite direction, then you will see that north pole here, south pole here, and the field, they remain the same, and you will see that this north pole will be attracted by the south pole, so it rotates the clockwise direction. So based on the power supply, it can rotate either anti-clockwise, 
or clockwise. And one interesting thing here, if you see the torque, electrical torque produced by the machine, which is flux, the field flux, is the mutual flux, that the flux here, the black line, multiply with the armature current. And this flux can also be represented by the inductance, multiply with the field current, and multiply with the armature current. So what you see here in this machine, the tor torque, if you consider this constant, then it's multiply, is the product of the field current and the armature current. So by regulating the field current and the armature current, you can regulate the torque of a machine. So this is a clue here. We want to regulate the torque of a machine. This means we can regulate the torque of a machine by controlling the supply current of the field and also of the armature. We mainly regulate the current of the armature, but sometimes you also regulate the field current. Like if you want to have a, a higher speed, then we do field weakening method to have the different speed and different torque. So this is the clue that we have. We can regulate the field current and the armature current to have our desired torque. So we use these characteristics to regulate the, to control the machine. And here, why we are putting it perpendicular? You can say it from here, because we have a bar, and this bar is rotating here. And in order to rotate this bar, we have to put the, uh, put the power 90 degree. And if we have any angle here, I need to reduce the uh, total power, total torque. Like if we have something here with an angle, and you can see because of this angle, it will have two components. One is this component, and one is the other side component. So this component will try to track the rotor in this direction. That's what we don't want. So therefore, we do not put uh, the brushes other than the 90 degree. Because if you put the other than 90 degree, then it will introduce, induce the new uh, torque here. That will just track the the rotor, not contributing rotation of the motor. So therefore, we always put the uh, uh, brushes at 90 degree. So if you have another pole here, then we try to put the brushes in the middle. So uh, they are electrically 90 degree all the time. So this is the basic about any DC motor, DC machine that uh, I was presenting here. Now I will move to the mathematical model of the DC machine. But if you have any question up to the basic of a DC machine, how it operates, and any question? Because I assume that you have a very good uh, overview of the DC machine from the previous course, so you understand very well. That's very good. Now we can move to the mathematical modeling part of the machine. So when we present the machine, we usually present the quantity, like voltage with a unit, SI unit, like volt, ampere, watt, horsepower, something like that. And we see that it's, it's good to present the model in per unit model. Then it's easy to tune the controller. And if you have something in per unit, regardless of the parameters of the capacity uh, of the machine, we always have those in uh, a kind of in a small range. Like if we have the current in one power unit, regardless of the total amount of current, whether it's kiloampere or ampere range, they always in one power unit. So that is the one advantage. We'll discuss also more about when we present the power unit. So, when is SI unit, and we'll present using capital letter, and when is in 
uh, power unit, then we will use the a small letter to represent these quantities. And we can present this machine with a fourth order model. And this fourth order model, two of them, two of the state variables coming from the uh, armature winding. We have the armature, since it's a winding, so it has inductance. This means it brings one state variable. And we have a field that's also bring another state variable. So from the electrical part, we got two state variables. And if you look at the mechanical part, and according to Newton law, we have the one uh, equation, one uh, differential equation. And then if we want to present also position, then in integral of the speed, that gives another state. So in total, we'll get the four state variable in a machine. So if you look at the mathematical model of the machine, it is from here. So the first equation here is for the armature, and we have the armature here. The first is for the armature. In the armature, we supply a power. This is the brush. And we can say this is UA. So we supply the UA, the armature, and then armature current. This is the armature resistance, RA. And uh, this is the armature inductance, LA. And this is the voltage drop across the inductor. And we have one voltage here, in this voltage, or back EMF, whatever you say. This in this voltage. And you can see this in this voltage is because of the field winding. And you are also supplying power to the field. And that field, the field, produced some field flux. And this flux cutting this armature winding because of that. And we have this in this voltage. So therefore, we got the first equation. And this mutual flux, which you can also write the inductance multiplying with the field current. This means this flux is a function of the field current. If you have more field current, then it will be much stronger. Yeah. And also, you can write this as a back EMF, or we can just simply write with E here, this part. So the first equation is for the armature part. And now we have the second equation. And the second one is for the field. So we are also supplying power to the field coil. And you can say it's UF here. So now you're supplying power to this field. So what you are getting, since it has some coil, and the coil has a resistance R, so it's the voltage drop across the resistor. And this is also same as the inductor. Like if you write it something like this, then it will be something like this. But you also can present it like this way. So it's the same if you remember. But we do not have this in this term. And why we do not have this in this term? Because this is the armature flux when we present, we connect in, we supply power, armature. And we will see that it has an negligible impact on the field part. Because they are local, we have a very large air gap uh, for the armature. Therefore, they're not coming up to the field. And we can neglect the impact of the field flux here, uh, armature flux here. So we do not have any voltage induced because of the armature here. But we have in this voltage because of the field, because we see that field flux is all going through the armature. So we got now first two equation, first two differential equation here. And now if we look at the mechanical part, yeah, this is the very common equation from the Newton second law. So you have the electrical torque minus load torque 
is this change of speed. We have the total inertia here. And the last differential equation, yeah, if we integrate the speed, that gives us the position. So this is the mathematical model of the uh, mathematical model of a machine. We can use this mathematical model in simulink to simulate the machine. Any question here? So what do you see that? The, in order to design the control, we need to present the machine uh, by mathematical model. So now we have the mathematical model, and if we have any derivative term, and we know that we can represent the derivative term in the Laplace form with S. We can replace this di. We can replace this part here with S in the Laplace form. So we can we can derive the block diagram from these two equations, from these four equations, and how they look like if you derive the block diagram of this, and you'll see like this one here. So how is coming? At this point, which is di over dt, and it is one over L, and ua minus e minus ra is ia at this point. So you can see that this is the previous equation that uh, for armature, armature current, and you have the armature input voltage minus E, and you said U is the flux multiplied the speed, and then you have the resistor drop here. So you got DI over DT, and then if you integrate it, this part, this derivative part, that gives us the current. So that's how we got the armature current here. So this is the previous equation that, uh, yeah, this is the equation that uh, we have here. And that's how we can present in terms of the block diagram. So we have the armature part, and now we present it in terms of block diagram here. Yes? Uh, the T in the Newton second law uh, equation, uh, omega times T times the Yes. Is that no more poles? Or? Yeah, sorry, I forget to mention that. Thanks for, yeah, it's a, full, uh, it's a pole fares. So, for example, this machine, we have P is equals to 1 because we have only one pole fares there. Yeah, thanks. So this is the first equation that then we present in the block diagram. And then similarly, the second equation here for the field, we can get it something like this for the field. This is the field voltage. That's the input voltage that you are giving minus the ohmic drop. And that gives us the di over dt, uh, d flux divided by dt. And when you integrate it, that give us the uh, when you integrate, that give us the flux. And when you divide the flux with the inductor, that give us the current and multiply with the current, that give us the ohmic drop that we subtract here. And here, what we are doing, we divide it by the LF. When you divide by LF, that give us the field current and multiply with the LA, LAF, that give you a flux here the mutual flux. So you got the mutual flux and we multiply it here. And also you have the armature current and the pole, fa pole, pole pairs that give us the total torque here. So this is the all equation that uh, we have here, the total torque, electrical torque. And then this is giving here the electrical torque at this point. And then subtract uh, the load torque. And we subtract load torque. And then 1 over inertia. And then we integrate it. That gives us the speed. 
And we know that the induced voltage um, is uh, multiplied in this voltage.